In this video, we're going to talk about maps, transit, service, trains, and buses. So right here I have pulled up the current sad state of affairs that is Colorado's passenger rail services. I'm excluding Denver RTD for this, as well as any tourist trains like the Durango and Silverton or Royal Gorge route. They aren't really pertinent to what we're discussing here today. So as you can see, we have the Colorado section of the California Zephyr running from Grand Junction up to Glenwood Springs, Granby, down to Fraser, Denver, Fort Morgan, and then sadly not a single uh, additional stop until we get uh, on into Kansas. And in the bottom right corner of Colorado, barely worth mentioning, is our pitiful section of the Southwest Jeep with only three stops, that being Trinidad, La Junta, and Lamar. So this is where we are right now. It's a bit sad, especially given Colorado's legacy as a narrow gauge superpower, as well as having incredible mainline standard gauge rail services. So we're quickly gonna transfer over into this other map. So this other map here, for the most part, over 90%, 99% of what you see here is already rail that exists in the ground. And I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about this map and what is the philosophy behind it. So we're going to start with the Front Range Corridor. Now the Front Range Corridor on this map I have pretty much modeled every single possibility for. North of Denver I have both the west and eastern possible routing. The western routing going through Boulder, Longmont, Loveland, on through Fort Collins, and the possible eastern routing going through Greeley. This is more of a legacy here. This probably will, is not going to happen, this eastern route, because even though it would be more direct up onto Cheyenne with higher speeds, it's really important that we hit Boulder, which has been struggling with their fast tracks program to get any proper rail service down into Denver. They do have the high iron flyer, but a rail service would be a welcomed upgrade, especially since they've been paying a tax for this for a very long time. So essentially this eastern section that I have modeled here isn't very important. It's more a matter of legacy of once upon a time, they thought about using this route primarily for those speed and cost concerns. So Denver here with Denver Union Station as our primary terminal and nexus for the front range. It will be the hub in which many trains come together and thankfully we still do have a very nice station, although it is sad that it is now a terminal, not a true through station, as real estate developers have ripped up the southern entrance to the terminal, well now it's a terminal, and turned it into a back in and back out type of train station. So a bit sad, but at least we still have it and at least it still sees service both with our airport train and our California Zephyr. So the Front Range Corridor will be traveling south out of Denver, hitting possibly Littleton, which is a great little community down there, on down to Castle Rock. Colorado Springs will likely have two stops, one being at the Air Force Academy and one being at their historic train station, which thankfully still exists and still is where it needs to be downtown. Then we go all the way down to Pueblo and where Pueblo things get interesting. The Southwest Chief and the Front Range Corridor have an interesting relationship because the Southwest Chief is kind of the reason why the ball got rolling on the Front Range Corridor, which is kind of ironic given that the California Zephyr is sometimes the more popular of the two routes. But we're talking about Amtrak long range trains here, so that's, mm, you're kind of fighting for last place at that point. But the Southwest Chief is very important to the history of the Front Range Corridor and how we got here today. But we see two legs here. We see a one leg, which I call the chief connection going along the Arkansas, and then the Albuquerque extension, which goes down from Pueblo all the way down into Trinidad. Both of these are based on existing rail lines, freight rail lines that is, in which is most likely to be the rail lines that the Front Range Corridor will use. It's not true high speed rail, it hopefully be higher speed rail with decent sections of double track and possibly some sections of additional track that will be built so that way these trains don't have to work around freight trains. Now the thing is is that some people say we should reroute the chief from Trinidad up through Pueblo and then on over to La Junta along the Arkansas. And the primary criticism against that is that you're taking a very long 40 plus hour train ride, which is the Southwest Chief, and you're making it even longer. So in their view, it makes more sense to have the intercity rail, which is the Front Range Corridor or the Front Range Passenger Rail Project, 
Instead, make me the one that goes to the chief, possibly down through Trinidad, which is my preferred routing, because Trinidad in and of itself is somewhat of a vacation destination. Sorry, La, La Junta, you don't quite qualify. But the La Junta route is slightly, slightly shorter. So that might be the reason why they go to La Junta if they wish to tie the Front Range Corridor with the Southwest Chief. I myself do prefer the Pueblo Trinidad route. However, I am open to both if funding is available. So this Albuquerque extension, Pueblo to Trinidad, really makes it easy for the Front Range Corridor to maybe eventually integrate with the rail runner that it goes all the way down to Albuquerque. This would probably be a handoff service in Raton, or maybe they would go further all the way down to Santa Fe. And that might be a train that exclusively runs from Trinidad down to Santa Fe, which is not shown on this map since I'm mostly focusing on Colorado. Moving up, we now have uh, the California Zephyr here. The California Zephyr, which has Fort Morgan, Denver, Frazier, Granby, all the way down to Glenwood Springs and Grand Junction. Well, first of all, I'm going to talk about something called the Colorado Zephyr, which has been brought up several times before. The Colorado Zephyr is essentially a Denver to Grand Junction, high frequency, multiple stop train service, something that would hit more little towns along the way. We'd still probably go through Fraser and Granby, but then we'd also probably make a stop down in Eagle by going backwards up some of the Tennessee Pass into Eagle proper, and also Glenwood Springs, and maybe add in Rifle and Grand Junction. The whole point here is to have a train that makes multiple trips a day instead of a single trip a day. So that way it's possible to access that Grand Junction to Denver I-70 corridor equivalent by rail. And there might be some branches that extend up, such as the, uh, the turn at Dotsero into Eagle. And also now I'm going to bring up the Northwest Rail or Mountain Rail train. This is the rail that section that is currently being used for a coal plant and crag. There is still some local freight along this route, but the primary idea here is to keep this section of track from having the same fate that the Tennessee Pass did, where as soon as the freight traffic, which in the latter days of the Tennessee Pass, there really wasn't any local freight traffic. It was mostly a through service, but, uh, we don't want to see that freight traffic dry up and then the rail line become a stranded asset as the Tennessee Pass is right now. So the idea is, is that once that coal plant starts to shut down and get dismantled and gets cleaned up, we will keep those rails active with passenger service. And also there are state tax incentives for businesses to use rail as a form of freight transport instead of road. So that up here is the Mountain Rail Northwest Rail project. And this looks like it's probably going to happen. Some people call it the extended ski train, which will go from Denver all the way to Crag. There are some criticisms as this is a very long and slow route uh, compared to the Tennessee Pass, which currently has no freight traffic, but also the Tennessee Pass is a long way from being ready to accept trains again. Moving south to the Tennessee Pass, you can see that past Eagle, I've added a little bit of a gap here that goes from the Tennessee Pass up to Vail. This is a very small section of track that would need to be built to get into Vail proper. It would be built along the I-70 corridor, pretty much paralleling the entire road. It seems as though it could be done, and likely this would be for passenger rail only, and hopefully it could be built in such a way where it might have relatively steep grades that passenger trains can tackle a lot better than freight trains but uh, still you'd want to keep it relatively gentle so that way it wouldn't be something like the RTD, which if you know anything about the Denver RTD, some of the, uh, the routing that they use looks more like a roller coaster. So hopefully we can avoid getting that crazy, but uh, still produce a relatively smooth rail line into Vail that wouldn't quite go full roller coaster that heavyweight uh, Amtrak trains could or the equivalent would be able to climb. So the Tennessee Pass here is quite important because it helps fill out what I like to call the Colorado Triangle, which is Denver to uh, Glenwood Springs or Dotsero, depending on how you want to look at it, and then having Pueblo down here as the bottom of the triangle. We are lucky in Colorado that we still have so much rail that still goes through relevant locations in our state, places people want to be. This is prime ski country. 
we have some of the best resorts and ski areas in the state along here. In fact, one of the uh, ski areas that is in quite a great position is actually Ski Cooper, which is at the top of the Tennessee Pass, in which they could almost have direct rail service to their ski area with a, a bus that just brings them up to where the ski area actually is, in much the way how the Winter Park Ski Express has rail access. Won't be quite the same with you know being able to get off a train and walking to a lift, but it's pretty close. Leadville over here serves as an interesting junction, depending on if the I-70 AGS ever gets built. That's the uh, the guideway, the monorail. Honestly, at this point in our history, we're probably most likely to see some kind of bus rapid transit system along I-70 that goes all the way up to Copper Mountain and then continues off of I-70 up to Leadville. This is important because of its proximity or really its direct line into Denver. But it is kind of sad that when they built that highway, it was built so steep and so twisty that there's pretty much no way for any traditional rail project to be built along it to get a Leadville to Denver connection that would be more direct. But still, the Tennessee Pass is relevant because of how it links everything else together. We go down to BV, which is a great little tourist town, great little whitewater town, Salida, of course. And down here, we have Cotopaxi. Now, the thing about Cotopaxi and the reason why I added a station here is because this is how we get to Silver Cliff and West Cliff. These uh, are kind of stranded communities that um, are the closest to Cotopaxi. It's not great, and probably the Cotopaxi station will never happen, even though they have had a station there historically. The idea here is, again, to make sure that if any public money is spent on rail projects of this magnitude, that we allow the largest number of people to be able to use it and remove those barriers for entry. We, I'm going to get a little further in this video when I talk about how buses are going to turbocharge this entire system. But for example, with Cotopaxi, you could have a bus going between Cotopaxi and Westcliff to allow that community to access this rail line. Then we keep on going down to Canyon City, which still has two railroad stations, one of which is at time of recording, is up for sale. It used to be a bank, but it is still an old uh, Denver and Rio Grande railroad station or possibly Santa Fe. It's hard to tell. Um, I'd have to look up the history of it. But the other railway station is, of course, the Royal Gorge Route Railway Station, which is you know, still in service as a railway station, but for a tourist railway, which is this little orange section right here. It'd be interesting to see if the Royal Gorge Route would play nice with anyone wanting to go through their station. That is a future video that I'm going to be making about the Royal Gorge rivalry, a little bit of the history of the Royal Gorge, the Royal Gorge Wars, and maybe the next round of Royal Gorge Wars, if uh, depending on what the fate of the Tennessee Pass is. We have a station down at Florence and all the way down to Pueblo, completing the Tennessee Pass stations. And now we are going to move on to the Grand Junction Delta connection and the San Luis Valley. This is really the reason I wanted to make the video because this is the these are the stations that people are going to scratch their head about because generally with you know the Northwest Rail Project, the Colorado Zephyr, the Front Range Corridor, the extensions from Pueblo that would uh, connect into the Southwest Chief, those all make a lot of sense. Even the Tennessee Pass right here with all of its various stops that give you access to prime uh, in mountain interior, even that would be easy to kind of uh, persuade someone to say, this is why we need to bring the Tennessee Pass back. And again, I'm down here in Delta and Del Norte with South Fork as well. I'm still building off that philosophy of using existing rail. So the thing about Delta and South Fork is that it really is, those communities aren't really the important ones. Uh, they, it's more of a matter of, if you look at this map, it's kind of north heavy and east heavy and central heavy, but there's a big hole in the southwest of the state, which is kind of sad because uh, this used to be swimming in narrow gauge with the uh, Denver and Rio Grande uh, Southern all the way down. Well, actually, just the Rio Grande Southern wasn't the Denver and Rio Grande Southern, but still, this area used to be swimming in rail lines. And to an extent, we still have Durango to Silverton, which is a nice little chunk here, but 
not really relevant for this. And uh, by the way, um, whoever thought it was a, a smart idea to remove the rail line from Silverton to Telluride, because yes, there was a connection there, um, or Silverton. Uh, Silverton did extend a little bit up to Ure, but didn't make it quite all the way there. Still, uh, whoever thought it was a good idea to remove the rail line from Silverton to Telluride, um, that person was an idiot. I know it was the, the 1950s and 60s when a lot of the narrow gauge got ripped up, but that is that is a crime that I will never forgive, that somebody thought that uh, Telluride deserved to have its tracks ripped up. Because could you imagine a rail service, a historic narrow gauge rail service from Durango through Silverton and then the ending at Telluride? Oh my gosh, that would be amazing. But again, bygones be bygones. The point here with the South Fork Station and the Delta Station is that these are prongs that help service Durango, which is our major population node over in the southwest of the state, and to an extent, Pagosa Springs as well. And even if these uh, the populations of these towns aren't quite interesting, you have to remember this is the heart of the San Juans. This is there is a lot of tourism down here. We have Wolf Creek. We have Purgatory. We you know have Telluride with you know the Telluride ski area, ski resort up here. This is a very highly trafficked, highly tourist location. It's also pretty gnarly at times. Um, through here, you've got the uh, the highway from Silverton to Ure, specifically um, uh, Red Mountain Pass, I believe. It is pretty scary, uh, not for the faint of heart. And, and to an extent, we also have Gunnison up here. So the idea here is with taking this rail network and then integrating bus services into this rail network, where now, it, like for example, Gunnison, you could have buses to Delta and then buses to Salida, which allow the buses to feed into the rail network and allow some of these stranded communities where in which like Gunnison and Durango, I think they only ever had narrow gauge connections and those are long gone. And in fact, the Gunnison connection is flooded under a uh, blue Mesa. So that's, that's never going to get rebuilt and to an extent Crested Butte as well. But the idea is that you have this rail backbone skeleton system in which the buses can branch off. So at this point, uh, let's go down to the San Luis Valley, which again, the justification for South Fork is, well, you know, the rail, South Fork still has its rails, um, and Alamosa as well as a college town. And that would allow people from Durango and Pagosa Springs to take a bus over Wolf Creek Pass into South Fork and then get on a train. And then that train would take them all the way through Alamosa over to Walsenburg through Levada Pass, which uh, I think Levada Pass technically is the highest active rail pass in the state, at least, of Colorado, seconded only by the Tennessee Pass. But of course, the Tennessee Pass being out of service doesn't quite qualify. But uh, the South Fork to Walsenburg line here, which most people would raise an eyebrow and say, like, why there's no one lives? Well, yes, people do live in the San Luis Valley. But uh, all the way up to Monta Vista, that rail line is still pretty active. Um, from Monta Vista, South Fork is kind of storage and a little bit deactivated, but technically still uh, still owned uh, by the uh, railroad that operates out of Alamosa, which is the um, used to be the uh, Rio Grande and San Luis Valley or something like that. Now it's it's that billionaire who almost wanted to buy the Tennessee Pass. Um, that's that's his railroad. He got a deal for it. He got a deal on it. He bought Walsenburg all the way to Monta Vista for like $10 million. Oof, that's, a, that's a lot of trackage, um, especially the Levada Pass. That's quite a beautiful section of trackage, which is uh, for a pretty cheap price. Um, but still, that's the reason why I have this uh, entire San Luis Valley section, which some people would raise an eyebrow to. It's like, it's yes, the people there are important. Yes, they deserve good transit. But mostly it's to uh, have this arm from the Front Range Corridor reach out to Durango and Pagosa Springs. And with regards to buses, the busting and a mountain rail network can coexist. And I think they can help each other because, I mean, I'll say it, you know, traveling by bus in the mountains in a blizzard, not exactly the most comfortable way to travel, um, as, you know, assuming that there aren't uh, delays. Uh, snow tends to not bother a rail line as much as it would bother a bus on I-70. So it is a safer, uh, rail is a safer way to travel. It is a more comfortable way to travel. 
than a bus. Uh, buses have flexibility. Buses can go up steeper grades. Buses can go where there aren't rails. Buses tend to, uh, I mean, if we're talking about buses being cheaper than trains, that's a different discussion. But the idea here is that maybe you can take some pressure off of the longer range buses. Uh, some buses will probably still parallel routes, like the Denver to Grand Junction. There currently is a bus stang that does that route, and that could run in parallel to the Colorado Zephyr, and they might be at different price points, and one might be faster. Um, they go through slightly different routes. One follows I-70, while the other one follows the Moffett subdivision and the UP Central Corridor. So you're hitting different towns, you're accessing different people, um, which, you know, and again, being rail is uh, might be a bit slower than a bus. Also, depending on the weather, rail might be a lot faster than a bus. So I like giving people options, but the bus staying will basically turbocharge this network. Um, and it might be something where certain busting routes are eliminated. Um, certain busting routes operate in parallel and maybe some busting routes are added. So I'm going to switch over to some busting routes now. So we're looking at the Outrider and this is Denver to Crested Butte. Now, if you notice here, this uh, is very direct up to Fair Play, and then it drops down into BV and Salida, and then it goes from Salida uh, over to, there's a seasonal stop at Monarch, and then it goes to Gunnison up to Crested Butte. So in this case, uh, this route probably would remain in its entirety. Uh, maybe it would be something where there's a bus that just makes laps between Crested Butte and Salida, synchronized with a Salida to Denver, route, uh, or it could be something maybe Denver goes down to BV and then turns around and goes back because again, the Tennessee Pass would connect BV and Salida. And if we could get these schedules synchronized, you could go bus, train, bus. Um, so this one is really one where uh, that Salida to Gunnison route is the important leg if the Tennessee Pass is brought back because that would serve as a feeder to connect Gunnison to the Tennessee Pass, which would, again, go all the way down to through Canyon City down to Pueblo, hopefully. That is something in my map that I uh, might have looked over, but the Canyon City to Pueblo connection. Uh, of course, that's just part of the Tennessee Pass, of course, uh, to get that Canyon City to Pueblo connection. But uh, depending on if you're going to uh, Colorado Springs, it might make more sense to go from Gunnison. And this is pretty much following the same route that you would likely take if you were driving. Uh, but going from Gunnison to Salida, Salida down to Pueblo. From Pueblo, you get on the Front Range uh, Corridor, and then you jump up to Colorado Springs. If, you want, if you're going from Gunnison to Denver, probably just take the bus, but we're providing options here. And on the other end, you'd have a bus going from Gunnison out to Delta, in case you were, say, going to Grand Junction, or maybe you were getting on the California Zephyr and you're on your way to Salt Lake City. We're trying to create options. We're trying, you can't judge the need for a bridge based upon how many swim across the river. Uh, I'm just trying to show you possibilities here. So now we have another route. This is kind of the, again, back on that Delta question. We have uh, the Grand Junction all the way down to Durango. And it only goes out to Bayfield, but poor old Pagosa Springs. Hmm. Forget if Pagosa Springs actually has a, uh, let me check here. Mm, yeah, Pagosa Springs. Sorry, uh, no service at all. That, that kind of sucks for you. You're, you've got Durango and Alamosa, which you're, yeah, yes, uh, Durango to Pagosa is easier of a drive, but um, if you're going to Denver, <laughs> then you're probably gonna drive all the way to Alamosa. Um, but it's, that's a bit tough. I'd rather drive from Pagosa Springs to South Fork and jump on a train that might bring me to Alamosa. Uh, versus uh, drive all the way to Alamosa, because eh, it's a bit of a longer drive. But uh, back over to um, our Durango Grand Junction. Here we have uh, our Telluride connection, which is important. Um, but yeah, Delta to Telluride, then all the way down uh, to Durango. This is, a, this is a route that would probably stay in its entirety, although maybe we could eliminate this uh, the Grand Junction to Delta leg. Um, and then just have the bus running maybe higher frequency, putting less miles on the bus, putting more miles on a train, just using this bus as an extension to get all the way down into Durango. And maybe if we eliminated the Grand Junction to Delta section, then we could extend that Bayfield to Pagosa Springs section. You know, a bit of a trade swap. So now, we, so now um, Durango and Pagosa Springs are getting a better bus service with the uh, advent of a rail service from Grand Junction to Delta. Now let's look at this one over here. This is our Telluride to Grand Junction. You know, 
Again, maybe adding a few more stops if we could eliminate that long section because that is the longest section that does not have any uh, any towns on it, which is um, a bit peculiar uh, that there's such a long... I mean, I've driven out there. There's, there's a lot of nothing out there, so I kind of get it. All right. And finally, let's look at this total map, and I'd like to overlay these two maps a bit and... Again, I'm not trying to destroy the Bustang, and I'm not trying to say rail is superior for everything, but the the Bustang and the rail network can work together. Like, for example, this Alamosa to Salida route would become very important because that probably would be the faster route if you were trying to get to Denver. Uh, taking a bus from Alamosa to Salida, then you get on the train from Salida to BV, and then from BV, you could get back on a bus and go up to Denver. Uh, possibly have a bus through the entire thing, but as I said, you know, um, well, buses are less comfortable. They're less energy efficient. Um, they do, they're more dependent upon road conditions. But we're not trying to eliminate the bus tang. We're trying to work with the bus tang, making the bus tang a better service and also making rail a better service. And this becomes really important in the future if we talk about battery electric buses or hydrogen buses. If buses get more expensive or if their ranges get shorter because now they're battery powered, uh, and also just how many drivers do you have? I'm not going to get into the whole self-driving bus thing because this is Colorado on mountain roads with snow. I mean, do you really want a self-driving bus to take you up over Wolf Creek Pass? I wouldn't because um, what good are all those sensors if they all get covered in snow? Uh, yeah, and... To an extent, you need a driver saying, yep, yep, we're, we're stopping here. It's, uh, you know, I would rather trust a driver uh, versus an AI to say, like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to keep driving up Wolf Creek Pass, even though I can't see two feet in front of me because I've got LiDAR. Well, you may have LiDAR, but what about everyone else? So still, there is a, a driver question, like how many drivers are available, especially in more of these remote areas. So being more efficient with our buses and having them feed trains and making sure those trains have passengers so we have good ridership numbers and also allowing those trains to have extended reach into communities that don't have rail connections is very important. And like I said, some routes will become redundant and the train will replace the bus. In some places, the bus and train will run parallel to each other to provide more service, more frequency, where, you know, it might be a coin toss, whether the train is faster or the bus is faster, or maybe you show up at the station and you take whichever one's waiting there for you. It's all about service, and it's all about providing that more efficient means for people to access these remote communities without driving their own personal vehicle, taking those risks if they're unfamiliar with mountain roads, and reducing the amount of damage that we do to both our environment and our road network. All right, that's all I've got for you guys, and uh, thanks for watching.